Jesus, another hand of praise. Come on now, how many love Jesus in this place? Praise the Lord, amen. Well, I'm grateful uh, to be able to be able to, to minister the word of God to you here this morning. And uh, I know you hear it often that, that we don't take it lightly uh, when we come behind this pulpit. Um, it's always a privilege uh, to be able to minister behind, especially behind this pulpit, amen. Um, I know we have our favorites in Victory Outreach, amen. And uh, I believe that our pastor is one of the, the best speakers in the entire ministry, amen. And so no matter how much you prepare, you always get nervous. Come on, somebody. But I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. I want to thank, take this time to thank my pastors, Pastor Alan, Sister Georgina, uh, and also the church, amen, the church, the ministers here. Uh, you guys have been a tremendous blessing to us, amen. It's been a little over two years since we've been here in San Diego, and uh, I can maybe honestly say this is probably the best two years of our lives, amen. Uh, and I know that that, that this, is, uh, this is just the beginning, amen, that God has much more in store uh, for our family, and I'm excited to be able to, to minister the Word of God to you this morning. So I don't want to keep you standing too much longer. Take your Bibles with me, and let's turn to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 12, and uh, if you were here Wednesday night, amen, just lean in uh, this morning, amen. How many know you can't hear, you can't hear a message enough? You know, I've been a, uh, you know, I said it Wednesday night, I'm going to say it again, I encourage you guys, if you haven't already subscribed to our YouTube channel, you should go ahead and do that and let those messages bless your life, amen. Uh, I've been, I've been. You know, listen to probably the same message for like two weeks. And every time you listen to it, you get something else. So I want to encourage you to do that. This morning, amen. Romans chapter 12, say amen when you have it. We're going to go ahead and read just the first two verses. It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed. Tell your neighbor, do not be conformed to this world or the system, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the key. Tell your neighbor, be transformed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This morning, before you see to give your neighbor a high five and tell them it's going to be good. Before we get into the word today, I just want to take this time to thank God for my salvation and everything God has done within my life. Amen. I know Pastor said there's a story behind salvation. Come on, somebody. Well, I met uh, Sister Monique. Come on, somebody. At work. Come on now. Yeah, I had to, it's funny, man, I don't know if you guys heard me say it before, it's funny, we, uh, I used to work at a, at the Greyhound station in San Bernardino, and uh, I was like one of the, the office leads, like, you know, and so this girl's, uh, she, she got hired, right, but, but her packet, her hire packet was on the wall for like two weeks, two, three weeks, so I told the manager, like, man, is this girl ever going to start, like, her this packet's been up here forever, and so the day she came in, I wasn't there. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but eventually I had to, you know, end up training her, showing her the, the ropes of the, of the system, and, you know, there goes the story. <laughs> Friendship turned into something else, and she invited me to church, and I stayed. Come on, somebody. I stayed, fell in love with the ministry. Uh, so you don't got to go through the home to make it. Come on, somebody. It's good, though. If you need the home, just go, <laughs> go to the home. You know, but, they, but but God can use you in any way, amen? Uh, this morning, oh, yeah, also, before I forget, uh, I, I got to acknowledge my, my mom, man. She's my mother-in-law, but she's my mom, <laughs> amen? And uh, she's also she's also a, a, a big part of the reason, like, why I'm here today. Uh, from day one, she's always embraced me as a son, uh, prayed for me, loved me, counseled me, encouraged me, rebuked me. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I know some of you guys don't like your mother-in-law, but I, I got a good mother-in-law. Come on, somebody. So I want to thank God for her as well. Amen. I want to speak to you this morning uh, on a subject titled Developed in the Dark. Developed in the Dark. And 
I believe this is a word that, that God put on my heart uh, for our church, and not only for our church, but but if you look at Christianity today, you see a lot. You see a lot of this taking place. You see a lot of what's taking place uh, in the world today. And so I believe. I hope you're blessed this morning uh, as we get into the word. So, in the early 19th century, photographers began to use what was called a dark room, and in this dark room is where pictures will go through the process of being developed. The process would allow the photographer to spot out any flaws within the image before the final copy was produced. And so from the initial development of the film to the creation of the prints, the darkroom process allows complete control over the picture. That process in the darkroom, the process that those pictures would go through, that they would take those negatives and they would begin to put them in that water and they would begin to lift them up into the light to see if there were any defects. Come on, somebody. How many know that God does that same thing with you and I? That before God wants to produce the final project, uh, product and before God wants to produce the final image, how many know that God has to spot out any flaws within our lives? You see, the creation of the prints and the dark room allow complete control over the, over the picture. And so as time goes on, we are seeing the decrease of use in dark rooms because of modern technology. Today, many people don't use dark rooms. Today, you can snap a picture on your phone. Today, you can, you can, you, you know, you can, got, you can get a camera. You can get your, your pictures developed like that. You know, back in the day, we used to have something called Polaroid. Well, you would have to snap that picture, and it would come out. You'd have to shake it a little bit. Come on, somebody. Make sure it didn't get in the light because it would get ruined if it did. You see, so now, you know, with modern technology, people have done away with the darkroom process. But this morning, as we dig into the Word of God, I want, to let you, I want you to understand that God is still in the business of using the dark room and the dark process to develop our lives. You see, here we see in this portion of Scripture, Paul he is writing a letter to the Christians in Rome, and he is exhorting them to stay true to the principles and the values that they have been taught. You see, at this time, Rome was very powerful, and the influence of the Roman Empire had a way of influencing everything around them. If you look at those times, you know Rome was the, was the power of that day. And whatever the Roman custom was, was a Roman custom everywhere. They had a way of infiltrating and influencing everything around them, even sometimes the church. Even sometimes the people, that's why Paul was exhorting the, the Christians there in Rome. He says, listen, the things that I've taught you, the principles that you have seen within my life, these things, you got to continue to practice them. You can't allow the world to change who you are. You see, Paul tells them, do not be conformed to the way everything was around them. If we look, if we think, and if we look at society today, I believe that this portion of scripture is very relevant. Very relevant. If you look at the church today, the church doesn't look too much like the church. The church today doesn't look too much like the church that God would want it to look like. If you look at the church today, you see a lot of churches now conforming to what the world says. Now conforming to the ideas of the world. Now conforming to what society says is right. You see, this is not the uh, type of church that God was looking for. You see, we live in a world today that anything goes. Anything goes. There, there's no such thing no more, well, for some, as conviction. There's no, so much thing, there's no such thing no more as living right by God. As living and saying, you know what, God says that we shall not do this, but you know what? They said it's okay, so I guess it's okay. You see, anything goes. And the sad thing is this, is that when you ask a Christian what they feel or how they think about certain issues, they give you a real weak answer. They give you a real weak answer. Why? It's because they cannot stand up against the tide because they're going along with it. You see, the reason why is because they're letting the world conform them to their system of belief or to their system of thought. And so we have to ask ourselves this question as Christians is do we believe the Bible? Do we believe what the Word of God says? Do we still hold a biblical worldview when it comes to our thinking? Or do we say, you know what, the world says this is okay, so I guess it's okay. You see, you got to understand that as Christians, we're not called to be like the world. We're not called to think like the world. We're called to be separate from the world. God has called us to stand out and be different. You see, the world's, the world's thoughts should not influence ours. 
The way the world thinks, what the world says, it should not influence the life of a Christian. It should not influence the way you live. It should not influence the way you believe. You see, we have to ask ourselves, is our worldview still biblical? Or are we allowing our lives to be shaped by the world? See, back in the day, questions were black and white. It was either a yes or no, do or don't. Now you have gray areas. You see, now you have gray areas, and, and it's sad that many Christians live in the gray area. Many Christians live in the gray area. I heard somebody say, if you, if you live too long on the edge, you're going to fall off. If you live too close, if you, if you continue to live too close to the edge, eventually you're going to fall off. You see, as Christians, you and I cannot live in gray areas. You and I cannot operate in a gray area with a gray area mentality that thinking that I can get away with this. Or how much can I get away with it? God will not judge me. Listen, God says if it's black, if it's white, you don't do it. You stay true to what the Bible teaches. We don't live in gray areas. We don't live in gray areas. We live a black and white Christianity. You see, the reason why this is happening is because the world has begun to shape certain individuals. And there's a danger to Christians that if you continue to allow the world to shape how you believe, eventually you're going to lose godly character. Eventually you're going to lose your godly character. Eventually you're going to lose the convictions that God and the Holy Spirit has placed within your hearts. But see how many know today that God is not looking for people that's going to follow the crowd. He's not looking for people that are going to follow what's popular. He's looking for people that are going to follow what's true. He's looking for people that are going to follow his will for their lives. That's the type of people God is looking for today. You see, so in order for us to become the man or woman of God we were created to be, we have to be willing to walk against the grain and sometimes, if necessary, to walk alone. Sometimes, if necessary, to walk alone. You see, we have to understand this. That, listen, if the crowd is going this way, we go that way. If your partner, if your brother, if they say, if they're telling you to do one thing and it's opposite of what God says, guess what? You may have to walk alone. Guess what? You may have to cut some people off. Guess what? You may have to turn your back and say, listen, I can't afford to walk with you because I believe God has a plan. God has a purpose for my life. And so I can't afford to walk alone. I can afford to walk alone. It's okay. It may be a little lonely. It may not be room. But guess what? God is going to do a great work in your life if you walk away from those that are going opposite of the direction God wants you to go. God's going to walk away. God, God, God's saying, walk away. Turn your back. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's not worth giving up your calling. It's not worth throwing in the towel. It's not worth compromising just to please somebody else. God says, if you got to walk alone, then walk alone. Somebody say there, there, there's little traffic in the extra mile. You got to learn. The, the, the extra mile is for people that have learned to walk alone. The extra mile is for people that have learned to say, listen, I can't carry this excess baggage. I can't carry this person all my life and just try to drag them with me. Listen, sometimes you're going to have to cut them off and be willing to walk alone. You see, many times... People come to church looking for change, but God wants to do more than that. God wants to do more than that. Change is good. We're not knocking change, but God wants to do more than that. You see, sometimes we come to church and we say, you know what, I, got, I want to come to church to feel good. <laughs> I, I want to come to church to, to, you know, to say I came to church. I, I, I got my time clock and I say, bang, God, here I am. Sunday morning I showed up, God. All right, they, they want to come to church to change, to feel good. Maybe they say, I, I need to come to church because I got to get my life right. Come on, somebody. That was, that was a lot of us. Right? We came to church. We wasn't looking for Jesus. We just say, man, my life is messed up. There got to be another way. I'm tired of waking up every morning and doing the same thing over and over again. No purpose, no hope, no direction. I just got to get right. Come on, somebody. Maybe you came to God because you say, you know, my family is a mess. And I need God to do a work within my family. Maybe if I show up at church, then God can do something in my life. 
You see, I want you to understand that these things are good and these things are a starting point, but God wants to do more. God wants to do more than that. Change is great, but God wants to do a deeper work within your life. God wants to get in the inside. God wants to under, want you to understand that it's not just about change, but it's about transformation. God wants to do a deeper work within your life. You see, God wants to move beyond the surface, beyond the surface. And too many times we ask God to do a work, but we're unwilling to open up. You say, man, God, can you, can you do a work in my life? Man, God, can you do a work in my family? And God says yes, but then you stay close. God sends a leader to begin to speak into that life. God will send a person to begin to speak into your life, and, and you refuse to open up. You see, God can't, God can't bring change if we don't open up. God can't bring transformation if you're not willing to let somebody speak into your life, if you're not willing to be told like it is, if you're not willing to let somebody step on your toes and say, hey, man, you can't do this. You got to be willing. You got to be willing to open up and allow God to do a work. One writer said, everybody is in favor of progress. It's the change they don't like. My God. You see, we have to understand that change is good, but transformation is better. I believe that transformation is better is because change can be resisted. Change can be resisted. You ever meet anybody that, that, that refused to change? Well, you're like, yeah, my kids, my wife, my husband. Come on, somebody. Don't start raising hands. Because change can be resisted. Change can be resisted. The reason why change is resisted at times is because change hurts. Change hurts. Change hurts when you're so used to doing the same thing over and over. When you're so used to being the same way year after year. When you're so used to doing the same thing, driving down the same road, talking to the same people, doing the same thing over and over again. How many know when somebody tells you, you got to change, you got to be different, that change hurts. And so people would rather stay the same than change. You see, someone once said we have two choices. The first choice is the pain of changing. And the second choice is the pain of staying the same. Either way it goes, there's some pain involved. Either way it goes, we're going to have to go through a process of becoming the person God has called us to be. You see, there's always a price to pay if we want God to work in our lives. There's always a price to be paid. How many know that God isn't just going to say, okay, here you go? <laughs> no, God's going to say, all right, you want to change? You want to be different? Give me this. You got, let me, let me have this. Let me take this out of your life because it's not good for you right now. You see, as, as change can be resisted, but when you're in the transformation process of God, how many know that there's no fighting God? You, you can't fight God. You can't say, God, no, I don't want to do this. Listen, when you're in the transformation process, God is going to have his way. God is going to do what he needs to do. God is going to make sure that the transformation takes place. You see, Paul experienced this firsthand on the Damascus Road. God knew that Paul would not change on his own. God knew that. God knew that. Just like some of us, God knew we weren't going to change on our own. God knew. He said, listen, if I, this one right here is good. He's, he's saved. But, but if I don't get a hold of his life and if I don't begin to move in his life, he's not going to change on his own, right? That, that's why when, when you first get saved and you, and you notice certain things don't work out for you no more, come on now. Come on now. Because God knows you ain't going to change if I leave you to yourself. God knows you're not going to change if I, if I try to let you do it on your own. So Paul understood that God, under, God understood that, that Paul would not change on his own. He even told Paul, he says, Paul, listen. It's too hard for you to kick against the goats. Really, what, what is he telling Paul? He says, Paul, it's too hard for you to try to fight me. It's too hard for you to try to resist what I'm doing in your life. It's too hard for you to try to come against what I'm doing in your life. Listen, no matter how hard you try to resist, God is going to have his way. No matter how hard we kick, no matter how hard we try to fight, no matter how hard we say, man, this isn't enough, this is not for me. Listen, God is going to have his way no matter what. God is going to have his way within your life because God wants to do a deep work within your life. He wants to do a deeper work within your life. 
You see, I believe sometimes that there are many of us that have been in a season where God is trying to be doing, where God has been trying to do a work in our lives, and, and all we do is try to resist God. But I came to tell you that God wants to transform our life. He'll do just that. If God wants to get into your business, he'll do just that. If God has to close doors, God will do it. If he has to get people out of the way, God will do it. If he has to end a relationship, God will do it. If he has to grab your phone and get and throw it out, come on, somebody. God will do it. Listen, whenever God wants to transform your life, God will do whatever it takes to do what he needs to do within your life. Listen, God will have people walk away from you that were close to you. God will have people turn their back on you. Why? Because God wants to transform your life. He wants to transform your life. See, God will do what he has to do in order to not only change, but transform your life. You see, I've learned that God will isolate you at different seasons in your life in order to develop the character of your life. God will isolate you. God will, God will take you from out of the crowd. And God will say, it's time for you to come sit over here and come sit down for a season. And, and don't worry about if you're being used or not. Don't worry about if you're the favorite or not. Don't worry about if your pastor patted you on the back or not. Because listen, there's some character things. There's some issues that I need to work out in your life. And, and if you don't get them worked out now, if you keep growing, you're going you're gonna to get yourself in a, in a problem. So God will isolate you. And, and he wants to build character within your life. See, I want you to know this is that God does some of his best work in the dark. God does some of his best work in the dark. The Bible says that in the beginning, that the earth was without form and void. And what? Darkness. Darkness was all over the whole world. Listen, I, I came to tell you this morning that God is still in the business of transforming lives, of taking nothing and making it something, taking something that, that, that had no purpose, that had no direction, and transforming it and making it beauty for his honor and his glory. Listen, God is still in the business of raising up those that have been cast out and forgotten and raising them up and making them treasures out of darkness. Listen, you need to get excited this morning that God is not done with you that God is not finished with you that God is still working in your life listen God could have gave up on you a long time ago but God says no I have a plan I have a purpose for your life and God wants to transform your life listen it may look dark right now it may look like you can't see what's going on but in that process in that season is where God is working in your life and you're going to come out of that season with more character you're going to come out of that season stronger than you were before why because because God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for your life. Don't despise those times of isolation. Don't despise those times when nobody's looking at you. They're looking at you, but God makes it seem that way. You know, I always tripped out about in the story of, of King David. King David, you know, we all know the story of King David, but the Bible says that says that when, 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 when he went to Saul, he went to serve Saul, he became Saul's armor bearer. But then the Bible says that Saul, for, he, he asked who he was after he had already been serving him. You see, David had to go through another dark time when he, even his leaders forgot about him. Because God still had to build some more character in that young man so that he could eventually be the king that God had called him to be. Don't despise the dark seasons of your life because God is doing the work. You see, Paul says, do not be conformed, but be transformed. When we look at the original meaning of the word transform, it literally means metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. See, the believer must undergo a radical change within his inner being. Within the inner being, the believer must be transformed and changed inwardly. You see, God isn't interested on how we look on the outside. God isn't interested on how, on, 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 the, on the, the show or the display or the presentation we give people. Right? We, 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 we're, we're good at making it seem like we got it all together. We're good at making it seem like, man, I'm great. God bless you. But on the inside, how do we look? On the inside, what's going on? You see, God isn't in prayer. We, we, you can't fool God. 
The Bible says that God, that God isn't, he doesn't look at the outer appearance, but he looks at the inward. Because God understands that he has to do an inner work in order to make you the man or woman of God he calls you to be. Right? Transformation is an inward process. So the believer must be changed inwardly. You see, too many times we want God to fix the outside. To fix the outside. See, I learned this before. How many of you have ever bought a car that you had to hook up? Right? Bought your car. You're like, man, I'm about to hook this car up. You get a paint job. You get some rims. You don't even worry about that engine. Right? Right? Car is fresh. You get around for a little while, and then what happens? Bang, the engine goes out. We, we look good, looks good, but we didn't take care of the, the most important part. The inner, the inner, the inner, the engine, what makes it run. The inner, the engine, what makes it get to where it needs to go. Listen, our spirit, the inner man, is what makes our body run. Our spirit, what's inside of us, what God has put inside of us, is what makes us who we are. It's not how we look on the outside. It's not how we can, how we can dress. It's not how we can talk. But what's the character of the man or woman of God that is on the inside? That's what God is trying to transform. He's trans he wants to transform the inner life. You see, God wants to work from the inside because the inside is where the issue lies. The inside is where the issue lies. We can look good right here, but don't nobody know what's going on in here. We, we, we can look good, but the, but, the, but the issue is on the inside. You see, when Jesus, he healed the paralytic, he wasn't just concerned with the man walking again. He wasn't just concerned with the man walking again. He was concerned with the condition of the man's heart. See, the Bible says that when the friends brought him to Jesus and they laid him in the presence of Jesus, Jesus didn't say, man, let me heal this man so that he can walk again. Jesus told the man, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. He said, your sins are forgiven. That's the, that's, that's the key right there. The key is, is that God, Jesus wasn't looking at the man's outward condition. He knew that there was a deeper problem. He knew that there was an issue in this man's life that if he did not fix it now, this man, no matter if he walked again, he would come right back. You see, listen, God wants to, God wants to deal with some issues this morning. God wants to tell you, listen, I know you come to church. I know you show up on Sunday. I know you come Sunday night. But listen, I got to deal with the issues in your heart. Because if I don't deal with the heart issues, you're going to come right back. And you're going to be in the same condition again. And week after week, year after year, you're not going to grow. Why? Because you're not dealing with the inner issues of the heart. God says, listen, that, that, that's the problem. The problem isn't the people. The problem is the those things around you. The problem is the heart. It's the issue in the heart. Son, your sins are forgiven. Why, why forgive sins and the man can't walk? Because the heart was the issue. Jesus, don't wanna, he don't want to give you the, 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 the remedy. <laughs> he, wants to, he wants to get rid of the issue. He wants to get rid of the issue. When you take medication, it just, it just, it just pacifies it. God says, no, no I want to wipe that whole thing out. I want to give you a new heart. I want to give you a fresh start. Listen, if you come every Sunday, God wants to do a deep work within your heart. If you're coming in this house and you understand that God wants to change and transform your life, then you got to allow God to work on the inside. You got to work on the inside. You see, he just didn't want to change his condition. He wanted to transform his life. See, the process of metamorphosis is seen in the transformation of a caterpillar into a butterfly. See, a caterpillar is an earthly insect. Some crawl on the ground and, and some live most of their life covered with dirt. Come on now. But there comes a time when that caterpillar has to go through the process of becoming a butterfly. Has to go through the process of becoming a butterfly. And in this process, the caterpillar will either spin itself into a cocoon or a chrysalis. And, and, and it is in this time where the caterpillar puts itself in that cocoon and the caterpillar begins to wrap itself in the cocoon. And what that cocoon does, it protects that caterpillar from all the outside influence. From everything that would try to come in and creep into that cocoon and mess up the transformation process. 
You see, listen, God does that with us at times. When it's time for us to change and it's time for us to be transformed, God, spiritually speaking, will wrap us in that cocoon to keep us away from all that negative outside influence, from all that, from all that compromise, from all that junk, from all the sin, from everything that the world tries to throw on us. When you go to work and you deal with unsaved people, when you're at the market, whatever you do, listen, God wants to just keep us away from all that stuff. So the caterpillar, as he begins to put himself in that cocoon, it cannot become a butterfly unless it submits itself to the process. It cannot become who God created it to be unless it submits itself to the process. You and I cannot become who God created us to be if we do not submit ourselves to the process. If we do not allow God to do what he has to do within our lives, you and I cannot become the man or woman of God that he has called us to be. The process is important. The process is important and the process is necessary. You see, it's in that season where it's dark. The cat is dark and nobody sees you, but it is in this season where God will begin to transform our hearts and he will begin to transform our mind. And this is the season where God has you all to himself. God will make sure that he has you all to himself. God will pull you away from everything that will try to get in the way of him having fellowship with you. God will pull you away from anything that will try to hinder the transformation in your life. It is in this process that where God has you all to himself. See, there's two characteristics of transformed people that I want to give you today. Two characteristics of transformed people. Number one, transformed people understand patience. Transformed people understand patience. You see, the caterpillar does not emerge from the cocoon immediately. Doesn't emerge. Doesn't just wrap itself in that cocoon and then the next day it's out. I'm a butterfly now. Right? Come to church one week, all right, I'm good. No. No, no, no. Not yet, buddy. Not yet, buddy. I went to Bible study on Tuesday. I'm good. No. Need a little bit more time to cook. It doesn't emerge immediately. See, they say that the process, the process depends on the weather and the environment. The process of the caterpillar transforming from a caterpillar to a butterfly depends on the weather and the environment. So this is heavy. I need, I need to share this this morning. See, the better the environment, the faster the process. The better the environment, the faster the process. You see, I want you to understand that, that, that if you come to church today, and I know you may be new, God bless you. You're in the right place. And, and if, you're, if you're new and if you've been coming for a while, I want you to understand that this house, Victor Aubrey San Diego, is a great environment. It has a great environment. It has a great atmosphere. And if you will submit yourself to the process of God and you will allow God to work in your life, I guarantee you that God will transform your life. That's not an if, that's not an and, that's not a but, that's not a maybe. That's a 100% fact that if you submit yourself to God, that God will transform their life. If you look around this sanctuary, you're going to see people that came to the church that, that believe God, but that they submitted themselves to the process. And week after week, year after year, they came and they allowed God to work in their life. Now they live a transformed life. And listen, I want to tell you that if that's you today and you say, you know, I've been looking for change. I've been looking for something different. Submit yourself to the process and God will do the work you got to submit yourself to the process listen you're in an environment where, where, where there's good preaching where the word of God is preached every week where the spirit of God has liberty to move where, where God does miracles and God does breakthroughs listen if you can't grow in an environment like this ooh, you need to check your pulse You need to check your pulse if you can't grow in an environment like this. You see, because God, you have to understand this. When you're in an environment, in an environment like this, there's no excuse not to be growing. There's no excuse not to be growing. You see, we, we, you know, 
You got, man, I sp- <laughs> you got to understand how blessed you are. You have Sunday morning, Sunday night. You have the family life flow. You have Bible study. You have, you have every component set up in order for you to continue to grow and become the man or woman of God that God has created you to be. You see, but we got to understand this is that those things cannot become a quick fix. They cannot become a quick fix where, where, where you're just looking for the next event to grow. Where you're looking for the next event to grow, you say, man, when's the next Bible encounter? Or when's the next men of valor? I really grew when they had those things. But what about during the week? What about coming to church? What about getting plugged in and allowing God to continue that transformation process within your life? Those things are good, but we have to understand that it's more than that. What I say earlier, God wants to do a deeper work. He wants to do a deeper work within your life. You see, giants did not get that way overnight. Neither did leaders and neither did churches. And I want to tell you that if you want to be everything God has called you to be, there is no other way around the process of God. There is no other way around the process of God. But the key is we must be patient. We must be patient in the process. The Bible says in the book of James that the hardworking farmer must be patient in order to to receive the harvest. How many have been sowing some seed? How many have been believing God for some breakthrough? How many have been believing God that this year is going to be better, that this year is going to end strong, that, the, that, that God's going to give me some momentum? Well, I want to tell you that, listen, it's going to happen. Just be patient. God is going to do it, but you have to embrace the process. Secondly, transform people, uh, they understand purpose. Not only do they understand patience, but they understand purpose. You see, once the butterfly emerges, it doesn't go back to being a caterpillar. Come on, somebody. You, you'll get that in a minute. Once that butterfly emerges, it doesn't, it doesn't say, man, I, I sure want to crawl around again. It doesn't come out of that cocoon and say, man, it sure felt good to just roll around in dirt. That butterfly understands that it has a new purpose in life. That butterfly understands that it has been transformed. That butterfly understands that, one, that, that it's not a caterpillar anymore, that it no longer has to crawl around in the dirt, but that God has made it beautiful and that God has given it wings to fly. You see, some of you need to understand that you're not the same person that you used to be. You're not the same person you were when you walked through those doors. You're not the same person you were six months ago. You're not the same person you were a year ago. But God has been transforming your life. God has made you a new creation. God has done a deep work within your life. And so you have to understand your purpose now. You're not called to walk around in the dirt. You're not called to live around with people that aren't fulfilling your purpose. You're called to soar. You're called to be everything that God has created you to be. You have purpose now. You have purpose. You see, we need to understand that we're not who we used to be, that we don't have to do the things that we did before, that we don't have to act a certain way anymore. We have to understand that God hasn't just changed our life, but he's transformed our lives. We got to get rid of the sinful mindset. We got to get rid of the compromising behavior. God wants to raise up a people this morning that have been transformed by the power of God. And so listen, if you want to continue to crawl around with slugs and you want to continue to roll around in the dirt with snails, then listen, then then go ahead and do that. But I believe that God is raising up a people this morning that understand their purpose, that understand that, listen, God has great plans, that God has a purpose for my life. I'm not called to hang around people that are going to pull me down. I'm not called to hang around people that are going to throw dirt on me. I'm not called to hang around people that aren't going to help fulfill my plan. God says, no, I called you to create, I created you to fly high and be above the crowd. Stand with me this morning. You got to understand that. Is that God didn't call you to hang around in the dirt. Snails move at a slow pace. That's not what God called us to be. See, one thing I need, I need to tell you this morning about the process 
of that butterfly coming out of the cocoon. This is going to speak to some of you this morning. There's a story about a man that he was walking by one day and he saw a butterfly begin to emerge out of the cocoon. And so he saw the butterfly, that it was struggling, that it was having a hard time getting out of the cocoon. So the man felt, you know, compassion, felt bad. Man, let me, let me help this butterfly out. So he, you know, peeled apart the cocoon, you know, to try to help the butterfly, give it a hand. And as he did that, the butterfly fell out. Bang, it just landed on the ground. And the guy's like tripping like, man, I thought, you know, a butterfly has wings. I thought it would fly. And as he began to look at the butterfly, the butterfly looked a little uh, deformed. Its body was swollen. Its wings weren't fully developed. So in his mind, he thought it was like, man, you know, the butterfly just was a bad butterfly. So later on, the man discovers that that cocoon and that struggle for that butterfly has a purpose. Has a purpose. You see, as that butterfly begins to emerge out of the cocoon, it has to struggle. It has to fight. It has to push its way out of that cocoon. And the reason for this is because as they struggle and as they begin to force themselves out of that cocoon, all the fluid in their body pushes out of their body and goes into their wings. And so when that butterfly struggles out of that cocoon, its wings come out fully developed because why? That struggle made it happen. See, listen, I want to tell you this morning that a lot of times we want our leaders to come and clip us out of every situation. And they say, man, I'm struggling right now. I, I just need my leader to help me out. Listen, we need to learn how to go through those struggles at times. Because it's through those struggles that God's going to develop what he needs to develop in your life. And so listen, sometimes as leaders, you know, we want to help everybody. And sometimes a lead, when, you, when you want your leader to help you so much, your leader can be doing you more harm than help. That man thought he was doing a good thing for that butterfly. But in reality, he, he, he hurt the butterfly. Because he didn't let the butterfly struggle through his process see I don't know who I'm speaking to this morning but some of you have been there some of you are there right now where you're struggling and you're saying man I just need a leader to come and clip me out of this and God is saying no it's time for you to go it's time for you to allow this struggle this process to transform who you are I didn't call you to struggle anymore I didn't call you to be stuck anymore I know you want change, but I want to do more than just change. Because change is temporary, but transformation is forever. When we live a transformed life, that transformation is forever. That butterfly can no longer go back to being a caterpillar. He's been transformed forever. I believe this morning that's what God wants to do. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, I believe God wants to transform some lives. I believe that as we, this morning, as we submit ourselves to the process, that God is going to begin to do that very thing. He's going to begin to do that deep work within your life. So listen, all over the place, if that's you and you say, you know what? I'm ready for God to transform my life. I'm ready for God to, 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 to submit to the process of God. Then I want you to come to the altars this morning from all over this place, from the front.